Greetings, friends, and welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour. My name is Jim Gallagher. I am the pastor at Clayville Assembly, which is the body of believers that sponsors this YouTube channel. And uh, we thank God for Clayville Assembly, for His grace, and for you, the listener, who's tuning in. And uh, we pray that these studies can be of some use to, to many for the cause of the kingdom of God and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Listen, we're back in the saddle, finally. <laughs> we finished our little four-part series on the nature of the resurrected body of Christ and the nature of our eternal bodies, be it those who were resurrected in 70 AD, or what happens to us when we pass from this life. And so we talked about that for four weeks, but now we're back to the series we were on. And I started this off by, we, well, we had one separate series, Jesus taught that he would return in the first century. That was his own series. And then we started a second series. The apostles taught that Jesus would return in the first century. And we're just looking at the time statements in the epistles. And all those time statements point towards a first century return of Christ. And they do it time after time after time after time. Well, we haven't covered the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, this will be the last segment of this sub-series within a larger series uh, that the apostles taught that Jesus would return in the first century. And John teaches it in the book of Revelation. And it is explicit. This is blockbuster stuff. Now, before we get into it, <clears throat> You know, I've recommended this book to you before. It's the uh, Parousia by James Stuart Russell. See that? James Stuart Russell, the Parousia. This, I didn't read this book until after I had embraced preterism and began teaching it at Clavel. I think I'd already been teaching it for like three years before I ever read this book. I didn't get the book till like two years into it. And then I let it sit in my shelf for like a year, then I finally got around to reading it. And what a great book. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it online. The Parousia, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A, the Parousia by James Stewart, S-T-U-A-R-T. James Stewart Russell. Get it. <laughs> You'll be glad you did. But it is just so, it's a beautifully written book, in my opinion. And he's basically doing, in the thickness of this book, he's doing what I'm doing in this series, not showing you so much how all well this can be. He's showing you this is what the Bible teaches, that he would return in the lifetime of those first century believers. And he does that in this book. Wow. But I want to read his introduction before we get into this. I want to read his introduction to the book of Revelation. I just think it's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. And, and I want you to hear what he says by way of introduction. Just one page worth here. <clears throat> and then there's another thing I'll read. I think I'll read it today. Uh, and it has to do, but I'll, I'll, we'll get into the, the beginning of Revelation, and then I'll read that other second quote. But listen to his introduction to this uh, this last segment of his book dealing with the book of Revelation. It's entitled The Parousia in the Apocalypse. Interpretation of the Apocalypse. Now, you know, I usually I don't want to read you something this long, but try and focus and pay attention to this, because I think it's wonderfully written. He writes this. We come now to the consideration of the most difficult and obscure part of divine revelation. And we may well pause on the threshold of a region so shrouded in mystery and darkness. The conspicuous failures of the wise and learned men who have too confidently professed to decipher the mystic scroll of the apocalyptic seer warn us against presumption. We might even feel justified in declining altogether, a task which, which has baffled so many of the ablest and best interpreters of the Word of God. But on the other hand, 
Do we honor the book by refusing to open it? And pronouncing it hopelessly obscure? Are we justified in so treating any portion of the revelation which God has given us? Is the book to be virtually handed over to diviners and charlatans to be the sport of their fantastic speculations? No, he says. We cannot pass it by. The book holds us, whether we will or no, and insists upon being heard. After all, it must have a meaning. We are bound to do our best to understand that meaning. Wonderful book, that after ages of misinterpretation and perversion, has still the power to command the attention and fascinate the interests of every reader. It refuses to be made the laughingstock of imposture and folly. It cannot be degraded even by the ignorance and presumption of fanatics and soothsayers. It can never be other than the Word of God, and is, therefore, to be held in reverence by us. I love that. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Russell, James Stewart Russell, Mr. Russell has a very, very high view of the inspiration of Scripture. And it's very apparent to me he wants to honor every word of it and not just pick out, cherry pick verses he likes and then construct an eschatology from it. No, that's what we have to stop doing. And those are the charlatans he's speaking of. Right? He says, Are we justified in so treating any portion of the revelation which God has given us by ignoring it? He says, Is the book to be virtually handed over to diviners and charlatans to be the sport of their fantastic speculations? Oh, you mean you mean like um Hal Lindsey in the late great planet Earth? Oh, 1980s, countdown to Armageddon. Sorry, Hal, didn't work out. False prophecy. False writings, bad interpretation. Jesus did not come back in 1988. Sorry, or 87, whatever you think. 1980s, count down to Armageddon. And you know the whole rationale left behind the series. Well, Israel was restored as a state in 1948, and a, and a, and a um, generation is 40 years biblically. So 40 years plus 19. Uh, 48 brings us to 1988. So he wrote the book, 1980s, Count Down to Armageddon. Wrong, Hal. Wrong, oh, wrong. I wouldn't bet you three Jaguars on it, the three Jaguars used to have, nor the two or three wives you've had. Like this, this is the crowd that writes these books. Forget them. Forget it. This. Speaking of this book, he says, wonderful book. I, I just love the way he writes. Wonderful book. That after ages of misinterpretation and perversion. By the way, has anybody questioned that? They said that Mussolini was the Antichrist. They said that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. They said that Napoleon was the Antichrist. I remember some trying to make the case that Mikhail Gorbachev, the mark of the beast, that was the stain on his forehead. Get out of here. They said Barack Obama was the Antichrist. They said Saddam Hussein. Well, that's the, uh, see, we're going into Armageddon. Wrong. John Wolford recycled his book. The Oil, Middle East, and Armageddon, something like that. For the first Gulf War, this is going to be the end, second coming's coming. Well, he was wrong. Good old Dr. Walford from Dallas Theological Seminary. And then when George Bush, too, picked up the second war from his daddy, the smoke in your eyes post-9-11 hoax war, then, well, John Walford re resurrected his same book for that second Gulf War. Wrong again. 
Well, these are the kind of guys he's talking about. And he's living in the 1800s. He says, wonderful book, that after ages of misinterpretation and perversion has still the power to command the attention and fascinate the interests of every reader. The book of Revelation is like that. He says, it refuses to be made a laughingstock of imposture and folly. It cannot be degraded by the ignorance and presumption of fanatics and soothsayers. John Walwood, Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, the whole Left Behind series, wrong. It can never be other than the Word of God. Speaking of the book of Revelation, Mr. Russell says, it can never be other than the Word of God and is therefore to be held in reverence by us. Do you hold the book of Revelation in reverence? I do. And that's why I'm not going to take a pair of scissors out to Revelation 20 just to join the corporate body guys. I'm not going to do it. Say, so what are you talking about? Well, forget that. You say, okay, so you're going, to, you're going to tell us that John in the book of Revelation is going to show us and teach us that Christ must return in the first century? You better believe it. Well, I'd like to see that from the book of Revelation. All right, let's go to the first sentence. You say, come again, Pastor. Let's go to the first sentence. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. the very opening volley of the book of the Apocalypse. And these are the words of John. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. I read that again. It's not that difficult. It may feel like it's difficult to know what to do with it, but as to what it's saying, it's not that difficult. It's not difficult at all. In fact, it's extremely simple. A school child could understand it. Let me read it again. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. John says he's writing about things that are to shortly come to pass. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants through this book things which must shortly come to pass. Whatever is contained in this book must shortly come to pass. Do you believe that? You can't believe that if you put the second coming in the future. Because you know what the book of Revelation is about? The second coming and the events that lead immediately up to it. What is the book of Revelation about? It's about the beast. Tribulation. Mystery Babylon, the judgment of the beast, the destruction of Mystery Babylon, the destruction of the old heavens and earth, and the creation of a new heavens and earth, and the new Jerusalem. 
Isn't that the broad overview of the whole book of Revelation? It most certainly is. I don't think anyone's going to deny that. And the very first sentence of this book says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Oh, well, Pastor Galga, you don't understand. You're not very sophisticated. Because Peter says a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. <laughs> and a thousand years is like a day. So therefore, God's outside of time. So to God, 2,000 years is uh, nothing. It's short. I've talked about that. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. First of all, with the Lord, a day of like a thousand years. But that's not true with mankind. And God isn't speaking to himself when he writes the inspired word of God. These were books written to men, inspired, given to the writers, and directed to specific people. Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth. Paul wrote to the believers at Ephesus. He wrote to the Colossian believers, the believers at Rome. The assembly at Corinth, which doesn't exist now, but existed 2,000 years ago. you got to take in audience relevance and the context of the writing that you're looking at. To whom is the author writing? And how would they have understood his words? That's hermeneutics 101. Who is John writing to? Well, we're told. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you in peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Now, he tells us uh, who these seven churches are, right? He writes these letters unto them. He writes unto the church or the assembly at Ephesus, Pergamos, Sardis, Laodicea, right? These were seven actual assemblies that existed in the first century that Paul was directing this book towards, the book of Revelation. They were real, actual churches or assemblies of actual gathered people under the banner of Christ. And Paul was sending this letter to them to encourage them about things that are too shortly come to pass. Well, how would they have understood that? You can't use Peter. A day for the Lord, a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. That just ends up being ridiculous. Then when he says he's writing about things which must shortly come to pass, then shortly means nothing. If, if, if with God, a day is like a thousand years, with God, it can be a thousand years, two thousand years, ten million years, it's nothing to God. So, any of the time statements like near, at hand, soon, shortly, they mean absolutely nothing. They could mean a few years, they could mean a few days, they could mean a few thousand years or a million years. Then those, those words which are designed to communicate time mean nothing. They add nothing to the narrative. The Spirit of God inspired futile and vain words which would only serve to deceive the listeners. Is that what we think about the Scripture? A day with the Lord is like, it isn't a thousand years, it's like a thousand years. Jesus said, this generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, there you go. Jesus said, there'll be some standing here which will not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, there you go. Well, how about John right here? 
He's writing in the book of Revelation about things which are to shortly come to pass. And he's writing it to the seven churches in Asia Minor 2,000 years ago. And how would they have understood that? They would understanding would be, yes, we're in tribulation, but we can need to hold fast because Christ is about to come. As John said in his epistle, it's the last hour. If John is writing about things that shortly come to pass, remember, he's writing about the tribulation, the beast, mystery Babylon, the destruction of the beast, destruction of mystery Babylon, destruction of the old heavens and earth, the creation of the new heavens and earth, the new Jerusalem. He's writing about things that are to shortly come to pass. Let me read that other quote from James Stuart Russell. When I read this, it was just such a beautiful thing, I'll tell you. This quote here, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, oh, I thought I had the page. Hold on, I can find it fast. Let's see, we're just going to get to the beginning. Okay, let, listen to this. This is just great. It's in a section in the uh, Apocalypse entitled Limitation of Time in the Apocalypse. He writes, this is not a mere conjecture. It is certified by the express statements of the book. If there be one thing which more than any other is explicitly and repeatedly affirmed in the Apocalypse, it is the nearness of the events which it predicts. This is stated and reiterated again and again in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. We are warned that, quote, the time is at hand. Things must shortly come to pass. Behold, I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. These are all quotes from Revelation. Yet in the face of these express and oft-repeated declarations, most interpreters have felt at liberty to ignore the limitations of time altogether and to roam at will over ages and centuries regarding the book as a syllabus of church history. That would be the continuous historical method of interpretation. An almanac of political ecclesiastical events for all Christendom to the end of time. This has been a fatal and inexcusable, inexcusable blunder. To neglect the obvious and clear definition of the time so constantly thrust on the attention of the reader by the book itself is to stumble on the very threshold. Accordingly, this inattention has vitiated by far, the greatest number of apocalyptic interpretations. Yeah, no one can agree on the book of Revelation, right? He's right. It may truly be said that the key has all the while hung by the door, plainly visible to everyone who had eyes to see. Yet men have tried to pick the lock or force the door, or climb up some other way, rather than avail themselves of so simple and ready a way of admission as to use the key made and provided for them. <laughs> what a beautiful picture. You know what he's talking about. For one thing, he's talking about the first sentence of the book of Revelation, right at the threshold. The key is hanging next to the door. Oh, how do we get into this door so we can interpret the book of Revelation? Well, Hal Lindsey says this. Well, Tim LaHaye says that. John Calvin says this. Martin Luther says that. And everybody has their arguments. And people are busting through windows, trying to climb over the wall some other way. And Mr. Russell says, the key is hanging right next to the door. So you can see it. Pick it up. Unlock it. And walk into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Here's the key. The first sentence. It really is right by the door handle. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. How in the world can a futurist exegete the very first verse of this book and then tell us that 99.9% of the book of Revelation is still in the future? 2,000 years after John wrote these words to the seven churches of Asia Minor 2,000 years ago for their instruction while they're in tribulation, he says, I'm writing about to you things that must shortly come to pass. We know how they'd understand that. And even Christian history acknowledges the early church believed that Christ would come in their lifetime. Futurist Christian historians and theologians admit that. They weren't wrong. We're wrong. And by the way, that's verse 1. Can I read verse 2 and 3? So he's going to, verse 1, he's going to write, he's writing in the book of Revelation about things that are to shortly come to pass. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy, the book of Revelation, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Do you realize that's the second sentence? Verse 1 and verse 2 is all one sentence. In the first sentence, he says, I'm writing about things in this book that are to shortly come to pass. In the second sentence, he says he's writing about thing, he's writing about these things because the time for these things to be fulfilled is at hand. You've got to either believe those verses or deny them. You say, if I believe them, Pastor, then I have to go back to the drawing board of my eschatology. So what? We can be wrong. God is never wrong. R.C. Sproul said it. R.C. Sproul said it. He was speaking at a uh, Covenant Eschatology Symposium in Mount Dora, Florida in 1993. And this is what R.C. Sproul said. And he was talking about the time text statements about Christ's soon return in the New Testament. He says, skeptical, skeptical criticism of the Bible has become almost universal in the world. And people have attacked the credibility of Jesus. Maybe some church fathers made a mistake. Maybe our favorite theologians have made mistakes. I can abide with that. I can't abide with Jesus being a false prophet. Because if I am to understand that Jesus is a false prophet, my faith is vain. I can abide with Hal Lindsey being wrong and Tim LaHaye and Oral Roberts and Creflo Dollar and Joyce Myers oh, and all the rest of them. I can't abide with John, the, John the Apostle being wrong, the author of the book of Revelation. I can't. I cannot abide by saying that the that the the spirit of God that inspired the words that John has put down in the book of Revelation aren't true. I'm not going to abide by that. I'm not going to have a sham faith. You don't want one, do you? Not if you're a Christian. He said, "But I don't see how it can work out. We haven't gotten to the how-to part. We're just trying to show you. You got some work to do. It'll work out. Trust me." It will work out. 
I'm sorry, I take that back. Don't trust me. Trust God's word. Be like a child. Implicitly trust him. The key has been hanging next to the door all the time. All these books they've written about, oh, this is the last generation. This is the last time. Oh, he's going to come any time now. All throughout the last 2,000 years. One huckster after another. Prophesying and speaking that which was presumptuous and not of the Lord. You don't have to live with that anymore. The key was hanging right next to the door. John says, take that key out. I'm writing about things in this book of Revelation that are to shortly come to pass. And when you believe those words and you turn that key, the door opens. The just shall live and grow by faith. Not faith in me, in God's word. Look, I'm out of time. I've got to go. We got more here right at the very beginning of Revelation. Next time, invite your friends. This is Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free.